When we picture Abraham Lincoln, the 16th president of the United States, we imagine the Lincoln we learned about in school. We imagine the tall, gangly Lincoln with his stovetop hat and chin strap beard. Lincoln giving speeches to Union troops. Lincoln mending a fractured nation. Lincoln sitting in the presidential box at Ford's Theater. But there's another Lincoln we didn't get to read about. A flip side to the strong leader, a vulnerable Lincoln, hidden beneath that stoic textbook grin. This vulnerable Lincoln, the Lincoln that most people don't remember, is a man we're talking about today. The young, angsty Lincoln, who wrote such sad, suicidal poems that his friends put a watch on him. I'd like to share one of those poems with you now, if you will indulge me. This is known as Lincoln's Suicide's Soliloquy. It was published in the Sagamo Journal in 1838. Here where the lonely hooting owl sends forth his midnight moans. Fierce wolves shall arrow my carcass growl, or buzzers pick my bones. No fellow man shall learn my fate, or where my ashes lie, unless by beasts drawn round their bait, or by the raven's cry. Yes, I've resolved the deed to do, and this is the place to do it. This heart I'll rush a dagger through, though I in hell should rue it. Hell, what is hell to one like me, who pleasures never knew? My friends consigned to misery, my hope deserted too. To ease me of this power to think, that through my bosom raves, I'll headlong leap from hell's high brink, and wallow in its waves. Through devil's yell and burning chains, they waked long regret. Their frightful screams and piercing pains will help me to forget. Yes, I'm prepared through the endless night to take the fiery birth. Think not with tales of hell to fright me who am damned on earth. Sweet steel, come forth from your sheath, and glistening speak your powers. Rip up the organs of my breath and draw my blood in showers. I strike, it quivers, in that heart, which drives me to this end. I draw and kiss the bloody dart, my last, my only friend. That was written by one of the greatest leaders our country has ever known. And it stands as proof that every one of us, even Honest Abe, can be emotionally vulnerable. You're listening to The Reengineered You. This is a podcast about self-empowerment and all the myths, lies, and misconceptions we tell ourselves. Then we use science and history to bust those myths and re-engineer a better you. I'm your host, Todd Laments, the extrovert, and I am j- joined by writer, researcher, Joe Anthony, the introvert. Good evening, Todd. How are you, Joe? I'm doing good, and I'm feeling pretty introverted. <laughs> well, I'm well-read on this subject, so I'm excited about talking about depression and vulnerable leaders because I always think of leaders as being these big powerful you know don't show their emotions don't get sad never have a bad day I feel the same way and I have a little spoiler that we'll get into which is vulnerability can be a good thing okay Let's see where you go with that as a vague concept vulnerability could span many different emotional states so we'll be focused on our discussion on depression anxiety, and sadness as it pertains to leaders. Feeling depressed or anxious can be isolating, can it? It forces us to take time to recoup, to take an emotional wellness day. And as leaders, we are unavailable. It feels like we're cheating the people who depend on us, like we're wasting time and money by being depressed, sad, or anxious. We we may even feel selfish for having these negative feelings in the first place. For forcing our friends or coworkers to take time out of their busy day to check in on us. And as a parent or partner, vulnerability can be even worse. If you have kids, secluding yourself can feel like you're literally robbing your children of a parent. And trying to explain depression, anxiety, or sadness to your partner can be terrifying in a new relationship or very draining on an old relationship. Today, we want to make you feel better about feeling low. 
We want to help you understand depression and anxiety just a little bit better and encourage you to seek help when you need it because everyone feels vulnerable sometimes in their life and our strongest, smartest, brightest leaders sought help when they needed it too. And the world benefited from their willingness to share that vulnerability. First, we'll explore the myth that vulnerability is a weakness. Both the emotions that make us feel vulnerable, the act of opening up to someone, we trust about our vulnerability. And then we'll explain how depression and anxiety might actually be evolutionary superpowers. Then we'll look into the myth about strong masculine men. Is it okay for men to open up? What do you do when you see your dad cry for the first time? And we'll ask the million dollar question, have we truly gotten over masculine expectations? Lastly, we'll share with you the steps for getting professional help. If you'd suffer from depression or anxiety in your entire life, when will you finally pick up the phone? After you skip work because you can't get out of bed? When you're finding yourself crying in the shower? And is there such a thing as getting a handle on depression or anxiety? We'll explore all these myths using history and science. But first, I'm going to explain to Joe why Lincoln probably wrote that suicide poem. So when you uh, sent me this originally, I had never heard of Lincoln's, I mean, I had heard of his depressions, but I had never heard of the soliloquy. I told you this story, and you, you right, remember? how if you first told about it, right? How's that? And I told you the story that Lincoln was writing suicide letters to the newspapers, and you thought, and then you looked it up, right? That's how it started. Right, because that sounded insane to me. <laughs> <laughs> that would be like you telling me that, uh, you know, I was, I was going to say that Trump tweets weird stuff, but, uh, but if you had said any other president wrote, you know, like for children's books or, or like wrote angsty, you know, teen band poetry, like it would have, <laughs> it, it sounded crazy. The point being, we talk about this shit in our, our free time, too. Right. <laughs> we actually <laughs> yeah. find this not interesting. Just, <laughs> not just the podcast. So, how do we know it was Lincoln? I mean, like, it it was under a pseudonym, right? A ghost written. Right. The poem matches Lincoln's poetry style, his meter, and his diction, based on the other poems he's written. And it was published in a journal Lincoln had submitted to before. The journal, the Sagoma, Sagoma Journal. Okay, so it it he had written before, so we had something to match it to. Absolutely, and it was it, it was a dead ringer. Okay, that makes sense. And so, did he use any like um, like a calling card? Like, did he did he use names or something that was specific? He uses the word dagger at a time when only Shakespeare readers were familiar with the word. Dagger also appears in Macbeth, one of Lincoln's favorite plays. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, the only time I had heard Dagger used was Macbeth and Dungeons and Dragons. So <laughs> that, that sounds good to me. <laughs> so something else I noticed um, looking through this poem after you sent it to me. I Apparently he has some dead giveaways in the way he speaks. Uh, one of them I, I found was, and this is listed on both Wiki and a couple other web pages. Uh, he uses the phrase, intensity of thought which will sometimes wear the sweetest idea threadbare. And that's really similar to his poem, where he says, To ease me of this power, to think I, that through my bosom raves I, I'll headlong leap from hell's high brink and wallow in its waves. So what that says to me is his friends noticed that his words match from his letters to his angsty poem that he sent to the newspaper. And that's how they're going to find out that I've been writing erotic literature this entire time <laughs> <laughs> or, or poems or whatever. Like it, it, it kind of feels to me like you share with your best friends, your best ideas, and then you publish those best ideas next week in a journal. This is a very, very thorough, creative call for help. Right. Exactly. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it was tough in the old days, right? To get, to get attention. Yeah, yeah. If you're going to submit something to a journal, don't use the ideas you've already shared with your friends. <laughs> so why did he write the soliloquy? Like what was going on in his life? Abraham Lincoln was clinically depressed. Everyone around him knew it. All his co-workers knew it. Lincoln's law partner, William Hurden, quote, his melancholy dripped from him as he walked. His apparent gloom impressed his friends and created sympathy for him. 
one means of his great success. He was gloomy, abstracted, and joyous, rather humorous by turns. But I do not think he knew what real joy was for many years. The perpetual look of sadness was his most prominent feature. If you ever write that about me, I'm going <laughs> to be like, very, no. <laughs> sounds like a real drag, a real downer. <laughs> right. That's like the uh, worst enemy at your like friend's wedding says that about you. It, it, it's, yeah. <laughs> I don't know what, he this did not re- know what real joy was. That this does, does, that this does remind serious. me of you though. You don't know what real joy is. <laughs> you are a miserable cuss most of the time. <laughs> Creative geniuses are that. Yeah. So you have a couple other quotes from uh, some of his other friends on his melancholy? I do. Francis Carpenter, a White House artist, quoted, I have said repeatedly to friends that Mr. Lincoln had the saddest saddest face I ever attempted to paint. (laughs) (laughs) So his painter is bagging on him. The painter recognizes the melancholy. Okay, here's another one. Uh, Fellow attorney, Jonathan Birch, quoted, His eyes would spark with fun. And when he had reached the point in his narrative, which invariably invoked the laughter of the crowd, Nobody's enjoyment was greater than his. An hour later, he might be seen the same place in the same law office nearby, but alas, how different. His chair, no longer in the center of the room, he'd be leaning back against the wall, his feet drawn up and resting on the front rounds so that his knees and the chair were about on level, and his hat tipped slightly forward as if to shield his face. His eyes no longer sparkled with fun or merriment, but sad and downcast and his hands clasped around his knees. There, drawn up within himself, as it were, he would sit, the very picture of dejection and gloom. Thus absorbed have I seen him sit for hours at a time, defying the interruption of even the closest friends. No one ever thought of breaking the spell by speech, or by his moody silence and abstraction, that he had thrown about him the barriers so dense and so impenetrable no one dared to break through. It was a strange picture that no one had ever forgotten. I just can't imagine that big, tall man up in this corner, balled up, and that he's just so unapproachable. I mean, it's scary, right? Uh, and what strikes me particularly about that vision is that he was laughing just before that. Like that quote opens with that he was, you know, the most joyous person in the room, and he's telling stories and he's enjoying himself, and then. Minutes later, his fellow attorney finds him curled up in a chair like that. Right, to go that quickly to that. It's not like there's anything happened. Right. And that that's yeah, scary, right? That really strikes me as depression. Severe clinical, yeah, bipolar, schizophrenic, something something extreme. Right. And, and like you said, it was just known as melancholy. Which I think is a great term that we should use nowadays. Yeah. As the souls are just saying depressed. We're going to try to bring that back. Melancholy. <laughs> it, it sounds a little classier, doesn't it? <laughs> uh, I'm having melancholy instituted into like, you know, psychological papers. I think this is making us happy. This is depression. It is serious. But since we're both depressed all the time, it makes us feel good to know that we share company with one Lincoln. of the greatest presidents of all time. Yeah. It's, it's like taking a fault and looking up and saying, oh, somebody so great. And somebody who did so much for our country had the same thing I've suffered through, which is kind of nice. It does say to me, too, that he didn't care a lot what other people thought. He didn't try to put up a brave face. He wasn't always a a politician. He was a man most of the time. And I I admire that. Right. He was willing to literally curl up in a chair at a party. Okay, well, I I suppose now's the time in our story where I try to um, validate Lincoln and explain why depression exists. When I usually start uh, research like this, finding sort of like the the evolution of why something is um, exists in the human race, like why do we get depressed? Why do we have certain behaviors or tics that kind of you know a percentage of us have it? It usually doesn't strike home like depression. Usually, it's an abstract idea. It's there's a certain amount of humanity that has like an explorer gene or a, a genetic trait that allows them to absorb you know alcohol in a different way. Depression to me was sort of like, I went into it thinking there would be no good answer, but there was. There, there's a good reason why humans have depression, and it kind of blew me away. What is it? So we're gonna, I'm going to start with vulnerability in general, and then we'll lead into depression. So depression is something that, that can come from vulnerability. 
And I'm going to, I'm going to quote some and talk a little bit about a Ted talk, uh, by Brene Brown. And if you haven't seen it, it's an amazing talk. Uh, yeah. I've seen all of, I love Brene Brown. She's great. Yeah. V- very humorous. And I love the way she outlines, you know, how she got into studying vulnerability. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give a quick quote because we're generally talking about vulnerability and we're getting into depression in specific. So we'll start with the general. Uh, she says, well, I have a vulnerability issue and I know that vulnerability is the core of shame and fear and our struggle for worthiness. But it appears that it's also the birthplace of joy, creativity, of belonging, of love. And that's such a profound statement during her speech, because at this moment in her speech, she's going to counseling. And it's after she had gotten the data and the information back on vulnerability. So for her, this is sir, her having a realization. And, and I enjoyed that a lot. That's how I see it. Too. I see vulnerability as being honest. Vulnerability is honesty. Right, exactly. And that's where the research led me. Like I started finding um, over and over uh, articles about vulnerability that talked about how uh, it, it makes you more likable. Uh, I figured it would just mean that people picked on you more. <laughs> like, like every the world is a high school. And You're giving vulnerable. them ammunition, things to tease you about. <laughs> right. You don't have to point them out. They'll find them on their own. Right, yeah. It's, uh, I don't have to tell people I'm vulnerable. <laughs> they'll notice it. They'll stuff me in a locker. <laughs> I, even though I've, in my adult life, there's not a lot of lockers around me. I still, I still imagine them you know, uh, appearing behind me to, so I can be stuffed into them. But uh, the um, there's a, a great article in the Harvard Business Review that say what bosses gain by being vulnerable, and really what it comes down to is vulnerability is seen as being authentic, and it's seen as uh, not putting on airs. The idea that you're vulnerable means that your people can connect to you and they can read you. That's something that's very important in the human race: is we like to be able to read each other and we like to be able to identify our, each other's emotional states. If you become a car salesman and everything, like if your if your face is frozen in plastic and you just have this you know mask of a smile on, it freaks people out more than it actually comforts them emotionally. They're gonna try to stay away from you because they don't know what you're thinking. They don't know if you agree with them, if you're happy, if you're sad. They you, you right. should mirror your mood so they know how to how to proceed. That's that's how I secretly felt, and now have been confirmed by this article. And and to me, it was it kind of reminded me of the uh, actor Paul Rudd. Like he's he's a he's Ant Man and the Wasp, but he's been in so many other movies where he's like this great comedic actor. But a large part of that is from him looking vulnerable on the screen. <laughs> like he, he does always look like he's a little bit confused, right? Exactly. Yeah. Like he, he's like he's like a confused puppy, and I just want to comfort him. <laughs> and and you, that's what you want emotionally in vulnerability. You want that more than the car salesman. You you want people who you can connect to. And that's what we want. We want people to be able to talk to us about everything. Right. As leaders, seeing vulnerability is not a bad thing. And it's even in subordinates, like you want to be able to look across the table and say, oh, they're upset right now or they're vulnerable right now. And you want to be able to have a genuine conversation for clear communication. Absolutely. Right. So going back to the research a bit, um, vulnerability is a negative if it comes from a source of shame. And that's, again, by um, uh, Brene Brown. And the idea is um, if there's something that makes you shameful about you, like, like if the vulnerability comes from a, a deep-seated place of not feeling worthy, when you feel you're not worthy, vulnerability is a horrible thing. If you go through your life thinking there's something fundamentally that makes you unworthy of connection. Just not good enough. Never be good enough. Right. Then vulnerability is the worst thing to ever happen to you. You have to project something else. But when you get past that, when you believe that you're worthy, and that's really the key that I found is, is in this, all this writing, it says, once you believe that you're worthy, even if you're flawed, vulnerability, vulnerability becomes a, a, a power. It becomes something that you project to other people. Your People see your vulnerability. They want to talk to you and connect with you. And on top of that, it makes you a better creative problem solver, and it makes you more uh, able to tap into that. So vulnerability really becomes, I mean, like I've, I've heard in writing, you have to make yourself vulnerable to tell a true story, to tell something that connects. And don't you have to be honest and vulnerable to ask for help in things, especially things you're good at, because you, you kind of want to keep that faith that you already know everything. You have to. Right. You, you have to be able to admit that you, that you don't have all the keys. That they might know more about this than you do. Right. And that's, that's where you start learning, too. 
if people see you're vulnerable and you, that you have gaps and blind sides, they'll support you. You you make other people an agent of your vulnerability. Not that they're making you vulnerable, but they help you with your vulnerability. And that's that's where really you start making connections in life. So there's there's one last study I want to talk about uh, about depression because you can't say vulnerability without depression coming afterward. I mean, like the two are so closely connected that that this podcast is basically going to be a duo. Um, This comes from a Scientific American article uh, called The um, Depression's Evolutionary Roots. And so first we'll state that depression isn't an accident. I always kind of assumed in my life that it was a flaw, like there was something neurologically wrong with you. Snap out of it. Right. Yeah, yeah. You you can just break it. All you have to do is, you know, leave the couch. Stop stop thinking about it, right? <laughs> but that's not really how depression works. Uh, there's something called the 5-HT1A receptor, uh, which binds to serotonin. And it, it does this in, in sort of different parts of the brain. It's not just like one little localized area. Um, but it's been preserved by natural selection, and it's found in every culture. So what that tells us is that it's it's almost an intentional mechanism, that, that we get something as a species out of depression. And that, that's, the, that's something that started really yeah, so making me... benefit. There's a reason. It's in us. Exactly. So we're going to get into that benefit today. We're going to tell people why they might be depressed. And this, to me, is kind of a beautiful thing. So what depression does as a, a function of, of how it changes your personality, depression makes you isolate, first off. So like the thing you read about Lincoln going and sitting in a chair and just taking his time to think. Uh, Depression also makes you abandon day-to-day tasks. You become lethargic. You stop taking pleasure in activities. You go through bouts of depression that can be lengthy and life-threatening if they're bad enough. And one would ask, how can that be an evolutionary benefit? (laughs) Sounds great. Sounds like a wonderful life. Right. (laughs) Um, But... To think of it more like a, uh, like a computer, not, not that a person is a computer, but think about the process of that, that it makes you slow and, and persistent. It makes you abandon normal mundane problems, and instead you ruminate. Okay. And that's uh, in the scientific literature, that's what it refers to as ruminations. You become uh, slow and persistent in breaking down problems which would normally require huge amounts of time and obsession to get through. So instead of just continue to make the few mistakes, you sit back, you figure this out, get a new plan, recharge your batteries, whatever you want to call it. Right. So when you're depressed, you go into that mode, uh, this rumination. And it shows um, in the literature, depressed people have patterns of highly analytical thinking as well. So they break larger issues into smaller chunks, and then they break those down further. And the funny part is depressed people know this. I mean, they, they refer to it as dwelling or, or brooding and the, all these negative connotations. But what it really is, is they're taking problems and just taking a couple hours or days, depending on how bad their depression is, to chunk up problems. Didn't you win a local contest on dwelling, Joe? Yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> you're very proud of. A champion brooder. <laughs> yeah. I've got a, a sash and everything. Um. Now, one last piece of this is that uh, depressed people have been shown to have better uh, social dilemma solving uh, abilities. So, uh, for instance, uh, when I mean social dilemmas, um, things like, do I bring up my husband's cheating and risk our finances, or I do confront him? Or if you're Lincoln, it's it's social issues like, do we go to war? (laughs) Big decisions, right? Right. And so depression allows them to sort of have this time to start this breakdown process where they, they seclude and they start chunking through this. Like they're processing it. Like think of a computer, like when it starts thinking too hard, it makes that grinding sound. Yeah. Uh, imagine a depressed person laying down, not wanting to move, and that sound just emanating from them. <laughs> That's kind of more the reality of it. And the uh, one final thing I want to I share with you um, mild to moderate depressives have tested and been shown to have a better judgment for something called contingent events. So in a contingent event, one thing happens because of another in a chain. So someone who has depression has uh, shed their rose-tinted glasses, at least for this series of events, and they can judge it better. So really what the evolution shows is that depression, as much of humanity it appears in, 
it's a mechanism to have like a certain segment of our population able to give us clear judgments. So just feeling bad and thinking something's wrong with you, it's not. It's in your DNA and it's there to serve a purpose to to make better decisions going forward, to to dwell this out and get a new plan of attack. Right. We just have a, a small percentage of humans who are built to be our Lincolns, where they will just shut down and process for the rest of us. And there's the lines that go too far, right? They don't put it in its proper place and it becomes who they are all day, every it, day. Yes. Yeah. Depression can unfortunately spiral out and take over your personality. And we will get to that in this, in our later discussion today. One of the common mistakes we make with depression, anxiety, or vulnerability is that we try to find causes. We go looking for the wound or the source of our pain. We assume we're depressed because our job is dragging us down. Or we're anxious because Thanksgiving is coming and we have to impress the in-laws. But trying to find the source of pain during depression is a way of avoiding seeking help. I don't need a, a therapist if my job was making me depressed, right? As soon as I fix X or Y, I'll stop feeling vulnerable, right? Abe Lincoln, who most likely suffered lifelong chronic depression, also attributed his most vulnerable moments to multiple tragedies he suffered. Um, Lincoln's mother died in, in 1818 of what was called milk sickness, and Abe was only nine years old. Now, that's a rare disease today, but in the Midwest in the 1800s, a lot of the immigrant settlers had killed thousands of people. It was a horrible way to die, this milk sickness. Um, cows that would get it would tremble and shake, have these convulsions. It was intestinal pain that was a, you die over like two week period. So it was a horrible way to go, horrible way for Abraham Lincoln to see his mother go. And they they clearly knew it existed. They called it milk sickness. So it, it, yeah, and it came from a root that the cows were eating on, and it was in all dairy products. But it took a while for them to eliminate and find out what the cause was. Oh wow! It was referred to at the time as puking fever. So can you imagine seeing your, you know, your mother puke herself to death? It's horrifying. Just that phrase scares me enough to never want it. Yeah. Now, poison itself is a hard way to go. But to watch someone you love in that much pain as a nine-year-old, it's got to be in his, his caregiver at the time. Now, Abraham Lincoln, this is something that I thought was interesting. I know it was, was Frontier Times and it was a different time. But at nine years old, after his mother had passed, he helped as carpenter, assistant carpenter with his dad, make his own mother's coffin. Wow. I would not, a, 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 as a carpenter at nine, I don't think I would trust a nine-year-old to like build me a cardboard tissue box. Now, his father right away moved away to find a new bride. So his primary caregiver after his mother had just passed of this violent poisoning death was his 11-year-old sister, Sarah. So you know how big an <laughs> 11-year-old is, right? Look, they're five. So, so that's this is just a slightly older kid to be your caregiver. Yeah, to replace your 34-year-old mother. So make your, you see your mother have a violent death. You build her coffin. Your father goes. You're raised by your 11-year-old sister. That's some pretty prim permanent scars you have as a young man. Right. Now, so the second big part of, of tragedy that came to his life was he fell in love with this beautiful, brilliant woman named Ann Rutledge. And she died when she was only 22 years old. They were engaged. Lincoln at the time was 26. He was head over heel, heels with her. Again, she was beautiful and brilliant. And this was the love of his life. Please don't tell me it was milk sickness again. It wasn't. It was typhoid fever, and she died in 1835. Abe was so grief-stricken that his close friends said that his personality changed. My heart is buried in the grave with that dear girl. He would often go and sit by her grave and read a little pocket testament he carried with him. He remembered her to the day he died. That is beautiful and tragic. But after the soliloquy, I'm surprised it was just like one or two sentences or a, a small book. So you see a pattern of young losses. And then this is the next one. That This one's really shocking, too. I mean, they all are, but this one was. Three out of four of Abraham Lincoln's sons all died. And they were all under 18 years old, the three out of the four. The fourth one lived to 82. Um, 
that kind of stress, loss, and depression is more than I think anybody could handle and not have at least a breakdown or that's, two. That's insane. I've I've read about divorce rates and how high they get after one death in the family, like one children's death. Most relationships don't last that. Yeah, my my younger brother died, and my mom is. I, I swear the pain is as, as real today as it was the day it happened. I mean, it just hasn't. But two of his sons, Willie and Tad, they got the measles. So he had two very sick kids at home for a long time, and he and that was kind of touch and go if they were going to make it. Um, Tad actually died when he was eighteen, and then he had a son, Eddie. Uh, he was th- three, almost his fourth birthday. Then he passed. Wow. So it's hard to imagine that much loss in one family. Three out of your four sons. If anybody could think that depression came from the events of their life, this guy had a reason. Well, then I think about him when he was in office and stuff, and he had two boys at home sick with the measles when he'd already had so much loss. I mean, how can you <laughs> work full days and and, right. that and be, be 100% and achieve what he obviously achieved? Right, I would be in the White House, and every time somebody comes in with a message, I would just shake my head and say, I don't care. Like, I don't imagine how he could do that. Now, Lincoln never recovered from the loss of Willie. Uh, he died at age 11. Both Mary Todd and Abraham were devastated, depressed. But Lincoln's vulnerability surprised his secretary, John Nicolay, and his ex-slave who had ranged Lincoln's wardrobe, Elizabeth Kickley. Elizabeth Keckley was shocked at Lincoln's vulnerability because he expressed sadness at time when men were supposed to be stoic. That brings us to our next myth, the double standard we have about men showing vulnerability. This is a tough part of the show where we ask the questions, is it finally okay for men to cry? So the question we're answering, is it okay for men to cry? I don't know if this is going to surprise you, but the internet has a lot of opinions on this one. <laughs> it, it was very difficult to use uh, Google or, or Bing or anything at all because everybody had an opinion. Uh, Reddit, there are so many Reddit discussion groups on whether it's okay for men to cry. Um, but generally as vulnerability, uh, what I'm finding is that it, it's, yes, it's okay for men to be vulnerable with a Big asterisk on on why. I think it's okay for other men to cry, but I don't want to be seen as doing it. Right. I judge you for, I, I wouldn't have anything against you, honestly. Yeah. But me doing it's way worse. It's it's uh, it's okay for everyone to cry, men to cry, if it's in sports, but not if it's your dad. Then it's just freaky. So. <laughs> <laughs> that's true, right? When you win the big game. Right. Yeah. yeah. But, but that's, well, you're that's, so competitive that yeah. Yeah, at the end of Rudy, it's okay to cry, but nowhere else. But uh, we're kidding, of course. There's there's a little bit of science to this and a little bit of opinion, and we'll we'll get into both. So, the best titled article I've ever read comes from this life science article, and it's called "The Science of Manly Tears," and it explains. Um, well, first off, there's a lot of horrible, horrible quotes online from people who have made huge mistakes in in the public sector, like like in public. Uh, so I want to state first off that um, you and I are okay with people being vulnerable. This isn't a judgment at all. Absolutely. This really does come from a, a scientific article that explains that there are slight biological differences in men and women and why we cry and where we cry and how it happens. So we're going to get into that a little bit. So uh, first off, in this life science article, they talk about how crying can make people feel closer to you. So like gets back to our vulnerability. Like when we we talked in the earlier part uh, about how vulnerability can make you seem more authentic, there's a picture of Obama when he was in administration to, uh, after a, a shooting, and he's tearing up at the microphone. His, his eyes are welling up and he's pinching his nose. And they did tests and they found out that people who saw that reacted positively toward his humanity there, that they didn't judge him negatively. They actually thought it was more um, revealing about him in his, uh, in his character. So connected, connected, a lot of people connected with him. Right. And it kind of reminds me of what you read about Lincoln, where it was, you know, uh, Keckley was afraid or upset about Lincoln crying. But by and large, that's not really the judgment we have anymore. We've kind of gotten away from that. And uh, the part about uh, men crying at sports that's 100% true. <laughs> in this article, they say that um, men cry fewer tears per year than women in total. 
But when they do, they're much more likely to cry out of positivity. So when your team wins or you watch a movie about, you know. You work, you, know yeah, you work your pride up to that where it just spills over. Right, exactly. Like we're happy because at the end of like, you know, like uh, Gladiator, you know, like he wins or something. Like it's we're kind of dominant kind of thing. Right. <laughs> we're, yeah, yeah, we're so happy about the outcome. <laughs> yeah. We're, uh, that, that's my reason. Whenever anybody, if they catch me crying, uh, I'll tell them <laughs> I'm just watching a sports recaps <laughs> on my phone. Like I'm, you know, somebody's winning a fight. <laughs> um, but back to the, the, the bioscience. Uh, it said in the article that women cry more often because they have shallower, shorter tear ducts and they produce more prolactin, which is um, what women produce during breastfeeding. So generally, it's not just uh, hormonal. Like uh, that's sort of like the shitty male thing to always blame hormones, uh, but it really actually is because shallow or shorter tear ducts. So they they actually can't hold as many tears. So that makes me wonder: how many guys do you see like throughout their life where they're like they're they're almost about to cry, but because they have deeper tear ducts, they're just like it doesn't come out. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah. I used to, well, as a young man, when I used to get monkey mad and about pretty much everything, I'd get so angry I would cry. And it was literally because of that. But it took a lot. Right. I had to be very angry. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, that's the frustrated cry. <laughs> I, I remember doing that a few times, definitely. So, um, in short, the, the, the takeaway for this is uh, crying is more associated with women. Um, but crying does not devalue your masculinity. Now, there's, there's, here's the asterisk. Uh, a lot of the sort of like unofficial polls and Reddit arguments and, and people online talking about this, it, it really felt to me like um, if somebody is judging you as a man for you crying, it's less about, is it okay for men to be vulnerable? It's much more about a person-to-person judgment basis. So if somebody is demasculating you because you're crying, it's really because they had a problem with you to begin with. It's they they had a problem with you as, you know, they didn't think you were showing enough male traits or they didn't like you for some reason. I agree a thousand percent. Yeah. And this is their, this is their way to insult This was an you. easy one for them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. They see you cry. That's just an easy one to latch on to. So vulnerability, still perfectly acceptable in this day and age. For men and women. Exactly. Yeah. Um, now we get into a little bit of depression. Um, how the diagnosis goes and why there's a difference for men and women and, and how that expresses itself. Basically, why don't we catch vulnerability? Why, why you know, what, why would you, should somebody like Lincoln's uh, servant be surprised to see it when he had it his whole life? Um, so women are, according to Mayo Clinic, twice as likely to be diagnosed with depression. And there are three reasons why. And they're all horrible. <laughs> It's the first factor is um, they're more likely to get an early diagnosis because women reach puberty first. And so they start going to the doctor first. Parents are like, oh, no, my kid is malfunctioning and it's just puberty. And so they, they take them to the doctor and then the doctors are more likely to catch depression when they're being diagnosed for other things uh, when they're going through puberty. Um, and another reason that they get diagnosed uh, is because they get watched more closely during pregnancy. So, you know, it fast forward eight years after puberty or four or whatever. Post, post, uh, post departum, what do you call it? Post postpartum depression. Yes. Yeah. They're, they're looking for that, but sometimes they will just catch simple depression. Okay. So it's not necessarily postpartum, but so they have a microscope over them while they're going through pregnancy. So they're not more depressed they're just more monitored. There's more exactly. check-in, check-in points in their life. Yeah, there, there are these points in their lives where they have a microscope on them, and it would be, yeah, the doctors are looking for reasons to say depression. And finally, um, the last one is the most heartbreaking one. Uh, depression is usually diagnosed for people who have an unequal power status and a workload that contribute to a lifelong self-esteem issue, meaning uh, not making as much money as men and having issues where they have been devalued throughout their life. That's how they get the late life depression diagnosis. Because they, they have to be the super mom, the super work person. They have to do everything. They do five people's roles in the house, and it's never enough. Right. So the one time where they may need the most support, and that's the time where they probably don't have a microscope over them, is, is later in life when they, they get that depression uh, result or, or that diagnosis. Now, here's another depressing part. Uh, here is why men go undiagnosed, why it's harder to spot depression in men. Um, so we said that women are twice as likely to be diagnosed. Here's why men are, are half that. Um, first off, 
they're more likely to blame chronic issues uh, on temporary issues and dilemmas. So like what we said earlier, men are more likely to blame feuds and work issues and sporting events and really just anything for why they're upset. I've done that. I've always downplayed the problems I have and how way I feel. And I just say, oh, it's just situational. It's just situational. Like that isn't a real thing, you know? Right. And it, and it can become so micro. Like it can be like, oh, well, I'm depressed because I had a fight with my dad like three weeks ago. Like you can, you can pick out <laughs> You can things. find something, right? Yeah. My right. job sucks. Your job always is. Yeah, jobs always suck, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. It's no different. It's just now you're depressed and now you're thinking about it. Um, but that's the nature of depression. It, it in itself is a mechanism to make you dwell and to make you parse out problems. So by its nature, it makes you start looking for things to fix. And so that's why men are more likely to blame those temporary issues and thus they don't seek help. Um, women are more likely to attempt suicide, whereas men are more likely to complete suicide. Uh, and that's simply because men are more likely to use guns yeah, and they uh, show fewer warning signs. More violent things. Exactly. Yeah. They'll leap off things more often or they're, use a gun more often. They're less likely to tell people how they're feeling. So that, that combination. Yeah. The, uh, to, to put it in a slightly crude way, but one that kept coming up in the articles I found, men are way more likely to just have a really bad week, get depressed, uh, and then get drunk, and then do it. They have no warning signs. It, it just it, It's a completed thing. Uh, as people in the suicide community or, or suicide prevention community say it, it's a um, permanent solution to a temporary problem. And that really seems, like the Mayo Clinic, what they're saying here, that seems to back that up quite a bit. We talked about how people saw the vulnerability in Lincoln throughout his career. Now we come to the important part of Lincoln's story, the real lesson we should take away from this vulnerable leader. Know when to get help. Now, doing the reading for this episode and, and just some self-studied things, um, I found, tripped over a few things I thought was extremely interesting. That he was, we talked about this offline with you, having when you write, being very obsessive. His people that he went to school with, the people that he worked with, said he was an intense self-studier. They explained it to him being like working himself into uh, a manic uh, state and study so hard that they would keep tabs on him. They would check in on him because he'd be reading so much. He was an avid self-learner. He'd get his hands on anything he could read. But they were afraid that he might learn himself crazy. If you've ever heard of that. I've never heard of that. That's, uh, uh, it's something I haven't heard of but now I believe in it. For whatever reason or combination of reasons, in the late summer of 1835, Lincoln's depression was pushed into the open air. After several weeks of worrisome behavior, talking about suicide or wandering alone in the woods with his gun, an older couple in the area took him into their home. Think about that. So, the, the tribe was trying to keep this guy. He's wandering around the woods with a gun. That sounds pretty uh, pretty scary. Pretty Stephen Kingish. That's not something I'd expect any couple to take somebody in like that. Like if you see a six foot guy <laughs> with a stoved pipe hat. When the average height was gun. five, six back then, right? Yeah. Right. Giant. Like slender man is walking through the woods <laughs> with a gun. Let's bring him in and give him breakfast. You'd be afraid for your own safety. and yeah. Right. Bowling Green a large merry man who was a justice of the peace and who became, other villagers said, a kind of second father to Lincoln, took care of Lincoln for one or two weeks. When he improved somewhat, they let him go. But Bowling Green said he had quite the melancholy for months. It was very common in Lincoln's life before in his office for his neighbors to take turns checking on him. Two major concerns was that he would kill himself or that he was flirting with becoming mentally insane. They, as a community, watch his mood and monitor it like the weather. Now, personally, I had a, a situation happen, and, and for years I never really believed in, it's kind of what we're talking about, I didn't believe that in breakdowns or being depressed. I thought it was just situational. And until it happened to me, and I had a mental breakdown over a breakup, I was in a very unhealthy romantic relationship with and I didn't know what to do the relationship was over I was so depressed Joe that I would have had to cheer up to commit suicide I mean I was that far down and I was just so paralyzed with not knowing what to do where to go to work or to brush my teeth that I finally 
reached out to somebody. I didn't tell anybody. I just didn't show up for work and no one turned my phone off. I reached out to my mom and she got me to a to some medical help. Right. But until that point, I just thought everyone was feeling sorry for themselves. But I swear, when you go through a, a breakdown, and I've had one of them, and, and I there's documented in Lincoln's life that he's had two. Um, you're never the same. You're like a cracked egg. So I, I can really relate to this. Mm. And you were convinced to go get help. I Because I had to. Because I literally was paralyzed with just depression. I just couldn't move. I couldn't think. I couldn't do anything. So it was, it was more of a just, just something, oh, anything. But the, the pain was extreme. You know, and it looked like in Lincoln's life, people were there his whole life to help him. And he like, had great friends and great neighbors. <laughs> we don't have neighbors like this anymore. Right. And, and lacking those neighbors, the folks that will bring in a tall, gangly man wandering through the woods. <laughs> we need resources like what you got. Like, like your mother taking you aside. And, and going to see people that will help you and talk you through it. Exactly. So we're going we're gonna to do that today. You, usually during the podcast, we end with more research points, uh, talking about science some more. Instead, we're going to do something a little bit different. Is um, If you're okay with it, I just want to read out resources people can use. Please. So uh, first, I wanted to address something uh, that most people... Looking for resources is like getting a safety line. You, If you're climbing a mountain, you want to connect a safety line when you're still strong enough to. You don't want to latch yourself onto a safety line after you're already falling. So the, the first question we want to address is, when do I look for help? Preventive medicine kind of thing, right? Right. Sooner the better. Exactly. If you ever ask yourself, you know, when should I get help? It's when you're asking that question. Yes. It's, yeah. <laughs> Yesterday. <laughs> as, as soon as you start thinking, maybe I should, then now, now's a good time. And that's not to be an alarmist. Nobody should ever feel like an alarmist doing that. They should just think, okay, well, maybe I'll reach out to somebody and just see what they say. See how seriously they take me and, and how much they can offer in a professional capacity. Um, so first, we're going to talk about expense. Because this is... Um, everyone can be struck by depression and anxiety. It can hit you at any tax bracket. But there are a lot of people right now, especially during this outbreak, that are in the lower tax bracket. That, that may be expenses of first you know, consideration to mental health. And it's your first block and excuse to not get help. Is I don't have the money for it. Once I get more money, I can't afford it right now. Right. Uh, we, we all think of uh, extremely expensive shrinks on TV t- saying, sit on my couch, and then they charge you $1,000 for a visit. <laughs> um, so we're going to dispel that sort of like that TV image in people's head. Um, first off, you can get inexpensive uh, help. Uh, first, check your insurance. That's, that's the first step. Uh, and then if your insurance tells you that your mental health isn't covered, that's when you should be looking at telehealth. Uh, it, telehealth is an old term. I, I think it basically it's just internet health and health that you can get through Zoom and through um, outreach online. Because surprisingly, if you don't walk into an office, if you just contact somebody online, they can help. You're getting their voice, you're getting their personality, you're getting somebody to listen to you. And they can do this for much cheaper online. Um, there's a good website for this called goodtherapy.org. Um, you can find somebody local, and sometimes they have options for uh, pay-what-you-can visits. So if you only have like 30 bucks in your pocket or, or online, um, then you can just sometimes pay what you have available to you, and they will listen to you. And I have to push back, too. And what, what's more important than your, your health, especially your mental health? Right. Uh, I, I do say this with a note of, I, I mean, I said that almost like if you can afford it, you really should afford it. You like, can't afford it, right? Yeah, yeah, everybody can. Take back some bottles and cans if you have to. It's absolutely necessary to get help when you start feeling you know, like it's too much. Um, and you, it, this may feel like a process. That's something I'm not going to downplay is when you go through this, um, you might feel like you're being uh, uh, sent from telemarketer to telemarketer. It can feel like people are putting you on lists and that they're giving you lists of numbers to call and you call and try and people are like, no, sorry, we're full up. It might make, it's frustrating and it might make you a little bit more depressed in the beginning. It absolutely will. <laughs> <laughs> but it's worth it. Right? Yeah, you, you, you go through the process, just do it. Yeah, and if you start earlier, like I said, when, it, when you still have the strength to start this process, that's the best time to do it. 
even if it's just to make those connections and see what that process looks like first. Um, another thing, if you're if you're a bit past the uh, the shopping around phase, like we talked about, uh, that's when you can start calling up non-emergency and anxiety and depression groups. Uh, there's a website called adaa.org. That's Anxiety and Depression Association of America. Um, they have a contact and resource list for all demographics. They they get so specific. You can literally find it for like male age forty who was a veteran. You can find it for a teenage of an age bracket. Like like you can go and find uh, your own demographic, your and niche. then you can select yeah. it out. Your people, right? Your exactly. Tribe. Yeah, people yeah. that understand you and have been go- have gone through the same things. Right. They'll have resources for you. You just find the link, and that will send you again. It'll start you down this process where it'll give you numbers. You call those numbers. They give you more numbers. <laughs> and eventually it leads to a human who will, who will ask you, you know, how are you doing? Um, the next step to that, so that was the non-emergency. The non-emergency is ADAA. The next one is suicide prevention. And this is the national line. This is 1-800-273-8255. That's 1-800-273-TALK. And that is when things move past Lifeline. That's when you need help immediately. Um, you can also get basically the same service on web chat. So if you don't feel like picking up a phone or if you're already on your computer, uh, you can go to suicidepreventionlifeline.org slash chat. Uh, or if you just type in suicide prevention line on uh, Google, it'll bring up the web chat. So it's very easy to find. Um, and just real quick, I want to share a, a brief story with you, Todd. Um, I went to visit our, uh, we're here in Oregon, and I went to the Portland, Oregon Lines for Life uh, suicide prevention line. It's, it's an office that they had downtown, and they invited me to sort of tour and to um, you know, just see what their process is like. You get a volunteer there or something like that? I considered volunteering, yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm on their database, and when they come up with some weekends for me to go do training, because my schedule is very strange. <laughs> Um, I, I plan to take their training, if nothing else, than just to learn good tactics for speaking with people. Yeah. Um, and it's it's very valuable to uh, spend your time on. I mean, like you you can't do something better for humanity than volunteering for something like this. But I'll tell you, if you are ever feeling depressed and you feel like you don't want to be a burden on somebody, that's not this. The, the, the people at the suicide lines, the people that volunteer their time there, they want to be there. They want to do this. And one of them, uh, I talked to somebody and I said, how, how can you do this you know, in, in your volunteer time? How, how can, mentally, how can you process talking to depressed people? Does it weigh on you? And they it's said, heavy, yeah. absolutely, it doesn't weigh on you. It, it, it's thrilling. And I, I thought that was kind of cynical at first. I was like, what do you mean thrilling? And, and they meant that it, it, just, it just charges you up. They, they love making a connection with people. They love helping people. Uh, they, they love speaking to them when they're being vulnerable. Because like we said earlier in the podcast, vulnerability makes you connect with people. And so to bring this back around, you're not being a burden on somebody to call for help. You're actually making a connection. And, and you can absolutely do that through these lines we've talked about. And I'm sure probably a lot of them have had, been in a similar situation. So they understand what's worth it on the other side. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. If you want to find a group of people that, that know how that feels and who know what you've been through, you can talk to them. So again, that's 1-800-273-8255. And if you're in the Oregon area, it's Lines for Life. And both of them are fantastic resources. Depression is real. Tri- trials are, are temporary, but I speak for Joe and I that we love you. We want you all of you to be around. Absolutely. I'd like to leave you with one final note. Lincoln's friends and his countries didn't just look past his vulnerability. They loved him as a person. His friends accepted it. And because of his long periods of depressive analysis, Lincoln was known as a realist, a realist with a firm grip on reality and a clear, untinted view of the United States and the political upheaval of his time. To quote the Atlantic article, Lincoln's Great Depression, his condition was indeed a character issue. It gave him the tools to save the nation. If you suffer from anxiety, depression, or sadness, you're not broken. In fact, you might be carrying an involved mechanism that allows you to judge things more clearly and analyze problems with long periods of time. Additionally, 
emotional vulnerability as a character trait imbues us with the passion to make us capable of empathy. It allows us to engage with the world, and it makes people view us as honest and authentic. Whether you're a man or a woman, you should feel comfortable in expressing feelings of vulnerability. If you feel you might be judged for it, there are places where you can seek professional help. Human vulnerability in any form isn't a mistake or a flaw. It isn't a temporary slump. It's part of the journey we're all on. And anytime you feel overwhelmed, get help. It's never too early to seek help. It's never too expensive to seek help. And you're never a burden if you seek it from the right people. Thanks for listening to the Reengineered You. Uh, reach out to us, reengineeredyou.com. We're on Twitter, uh, YouTube, Instagram, Facebook. Um, we don't know everything, but we have an opinion on everything. So we'd like to hear yours. Thank you.